Well, I think it's a good question about what's going to happen with augmented and virtual reality when it comes to the podcasting media. I've been doing some thinking about that over the last probably six months to a year. Hello, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, I interview peak performing innovators in the creative, social impact, and earth conservation spaces who are working to change the world. This episode is brought to you by Brain FM. Brain FM combines the best of music and neuroscience to help you relax, focus, meditate, and even sleep. I love it and have been using it to write, create, and do some of my deepest work. Because you're a listener of the show, you can get a free trial. Head over to brain.fm slash innovative mindset to check it out. If you decide to subscribe, you can get 20% off with the coupon code innovative mindset, all one word. And now let's get to the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. Super happy that you're here and super happy and honored to welcome this week's guest, Rob Greenlee. Rob is the VP of Content and Partnerships at Libsyn and AdvertiseCast. He's a well-known 17-plus year evangelist of the podcasting industry. He's a current board member and former chairperson of the Podcast Academy, current chairperson of the Podcast Hall of Fame Induction Committee, and 2017 inductee into the Podcast Hall of Fame. In his role... At Libsyn and AdvertiseCast, Rob is responsible for managing content provider, technology, distribution, and monetization partner relationships who entrust their content to Libsyn's pioneering podcast tools. Rob's long and storied history on nationally syndicated terrestrial broadcast radio starting 1999, then webcast and podcast, Web Talk World Radio Show, was heard on XM Satellite Radio and is recognized as the first broadcast radio program in the world to begin podcasting on September 15th, 2004. I'm super honored that Rob has taken the time to be here. Rob, welcome. Hi, Zola. It's great to be here again. Thank you. I, 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 I'm so thrilled to talk to you because I look to you, honestly, as the voice of reason and also as the voice of innovation when it comes to the entire podcasting arena. You're you're always both down to earth, but also far seeing. So I'm super grateful that you took the time to be here, especially right now, especially today, since this week marks podcast movement, which is huge for anybody who's a podcaster. But also, uh, when the day we're recording it actually is the day of the inductees to the Podcasting Hall of Fame coming out. So there's all sorts of stuff to talk about with respect to where podcasting is and where it's going. I am I would like to, if it's okay with you, talk a little bit first about your answer to a question. <laughs> Somebody somewhere posted, and I don't even remember where I saw it. They posted the question, what are the three major aspects of a great podcast? And you put out a thing that said, here is my answer to the question. And I would love to unpack those answers because really it's where podcasting is right now. And I think also where it's going. Would that be okay with you? Yeah, I think so. Sure. Okay. Let's, let's, let's do it. Let's dive in. <laughs> so so the, the, the way you answer the question, let me read the answers, and then I'd love to ask you some questions about it. You said the answer is complex and challenging to do, thus the difficulty in making a compellingly good podcast. One, have good content value through the combination of educational, entertaining, and informational interaction between people while being good at short and long-form storytelling. That one itself is huge. Two, create emotions and listeners through really being real, personable, and talking to one person, showing care, appreciation, and consideration for guests, co-hosts, and listeners, being real and authentic. And three, it's someone who creates consistent and good sound quality audio on a regular and predictable schedule. Wow. Those are great answers, but I'd love it if you would talk a little bit about what it means when you first, the first part of your answer, have good content value through the combination of educational, entertaining, informational interaction between people while being good at short and long form storytelling. What does that mean? What are all of those facets of good podcasting? Well, I agree. It is quite a quite a complex bucket of um, aspirations, is what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the simple explanation, and it, it 
and it may be painting a picture that may be relatively impossible to accomplish. Mm. Um, but I think from an aspirational perspective, it, it does kind of spell out the, the unique challenge of being a um, popular and successful podcaster that uh, needs to walk all those pieces and do them well. And, and it's not always easy to un understand how to do all those things um, right away when you start a podcast, right? If you've never done radio or if you've never done presentations or content production or anything like that, it can be um, daunting to take on all those aspects and making sure that you're delivering good value in all those areas, right? To be educational, to be entertaining, to be informational, while at the same time being this person that everybody wants to listen to and engage with, you know, all, all that stuff. And I think a really terrific example of that, and I, I hate to use his name at this point because he's so controversial, is Joe Rogan. If you really think about what Joe does in his show, he basically covers all those aspects. Um, and he's probably one of the best in the world that I'm, I'm aware of that actually has done that in podcasting. And, and I think um, that really, to me, it, it really explains why he's as popular as he is, is because he's been able to walk those lines, even though it takes him into very controversial territory um, in his topics and the things that he talks about. But that's exactly what it takes, I think, to be successful in, in, on a massive scale. Uh, with podcasting. And I, I had a, a radio show that I started back in 1999. And I had no experience in, in doing radio at the time I walked into a radio station, I had a, a couple of co hosts around with me. And we started producing shows and I, I started to do a show that kind of, you know, had those buckets um, that were in it, it was, it was informational, it had some entertainment aspects to it. It also had educational stuff. Um, and, and it had multiple people. I had multiple people in the studio with me and there was interaction with, with listeners as well as in the show itself. And a lot of what we did in there was relatively short form storytelling. But because if you really back up and you think about it, um, all podcasting is really storytelling. Uh, just like what I'm doing right now, I'm telling a story about what my perception of what a podcast um, is and what it should be. Um, to become successful. And, and, and it's, it's really that simple. And, and though it's so simple, it's complex at the same time. Um, and then over time, I, I evolved that show that I did. So I, I, I learned, you know, from practical experience, and all these aspects, and it's not always easy to replicate, because it depends on the format of the show and what you're doing, and who's involved in it and the personalities involved in the in the production, whether or not it really successfully hits all those key areas 100%, right? I think some shows are very good on education, uh, but maybe not as entertaining. And then there's other shows that are great with information, right? Data, things like that, that may not be really um, have a strong kind of connection with an audience, it can be a little bit too data centric or something like that. So you can kind of see how it kind of juggles um, lots of things, but to bring it all together, it takes kind of, kind of a unique skill. I'm taking all that in. <laughs> it, it, there, there was a lot there. It, it's interesting when I hear you talk about storytelling and the fact that you're telling a story, there's a difference between telling sort of a nonfiction type story, right. a creative nonfiction story, maybe even, and something that is fictional, like some of those podcasts that have gone through uh, like serial or something like that, where they were right. where they were telling a story long form throughout mm -hmm. a number of episodes, right. and so when you're looking at those kinds of of podcasts that are that are more fictional in nature, that are designed to probably be more entertaining, how I guess how okay is it? I mean, it was wildly successful, so I imagine it's pretty okay. It, I guess it depends on what audience you're talking to. Right. In right. order to, to know whether or not you're going to have 50% entertaining versus informational versus educational, et cetera. Well, I think a good, even a fictional storytelling um, podcast will have elements of all these things. It's mm. just what they, how they present them um, may not be strictly like, you know, like um, 
you know, college educational kind of thing. It's, it, but it's, it, it may be educational in context, right? Of a bigger, bigger historical orientation towards something. And hopefully it's telling, telling that, that historical reference in, in some level of, of truth, right? Um, and authenticity. Um, and then other um, long form storytelling also has, you know, the combination of information and education are kind of similar to each other. Um, but most of the, even, even the, the long form s storytelling aspects have some form of, especially the fiction side, have some form of entertainment in them. And then they, by their very nature, their, their, um, the, the scripts that they do for those programs are highly, um, they engage with other people, right, during the production, right? If there's multiple actors, performers um, that, that participate in the production, uh, if there's a correspondent or reporter or they're talking to an expert or a, or a guest or a witness or something like that, that creates that, that feeling in the content of that there's more people involved than just one person. And I think that's, that's one of the challenges that I, I think solo casters have is is it it's difficult to create conversation uh, when there's just one person right so when you and this is a, also another unique talent too is that if you are a solo caster and you're producing a show like that and there's plenty of examples of this you have to look at your audience as that person that you're interacting with it's almost like the concept of sitting at starbucks Right, and you're talking to a person you met at Starbucks, right? That's kind of how you have to think about your solo cast, right? You're you're speaking with somebody, and you're you're kind of almost hearing them, you know, respond to what you're saying, and then you're kind of answering their questions bef while they're forming it in your mind, but you're thinking that they're going to form that in the listener's mind, right? So you're always trying to answer questions that come up as part of your dialogue, and I think. Um, you know, like a Dan Bongino is another example of a podcaster that really speaks to his audience, right? He like, he, he like gestures. I mean, he does video too, but he like gestures at his viewers, right? Mm -hmm. he, he's like talking to them like they're standing right in front of him and, and having a conversation, not a scripted type of, type of thing. So you kind of, you know, podcasting is a lot about kind of understanding the psychology of, of yourself and then understanding the psychology of the listener too, and being able to engage like they're standing right there and you're talking to one person. And I mean, it's, it's not the panacea that will accomplish everything for you, but I do think that, that there's those characteristics that exist um, with individuals that have shown success. Uh, if you really watch and you really think about their behavior and how they interact in their their program and how they speak to their audience uh it definitely comes across as like he's speaking to one person yeah absolutely and i i love i love the way you put it and in fact this is i i do the way this show is run for example the mm -hmm. way i run this show it's a five mm -hmm. five days a week mm -hmm. one day a week is interviews somebody that i want to speak with on the show and the other four days i'm a solo caster right so so it's interesting to me to that when I like what you said about having a coffee, I literally say that before shows that, hey, it's like we're sitting at Starbucks and having a cup of coffee. It's a chat instead of a really formal interview, even though, you know, a podcaster might have questions that they want to ask that are written out so that they're not going to I don't know what to say next. But uh, the conversation needs to flow as well. There needs to be a certain amount of give and take. So having said that, when you're doing a solo cast and you are imagining that you're talking to one person, what kind of anticipatory behavior should you have with respect to what you think your audience is, wants to know? Yeah, and that's that's the skill of practice, right? So when you you almost have to get in your own head, right? And, and, and say that I'm, I'm like, I'm talking about this, but I'm thinking about what I would be thinking about if someone was listening to me say this, right? Mm. And, and what would be the next logical thing that I would talk about? And this, this kind of gets back to the format of the show too. I mean, if you're, um, if you're scripted, and you've got a strict outline, and you're just trying to cover information, 
um, then you're just going to go bang through those items and you're going to share that information. But if it's a stream of consciousness type of presentation where you have an outline and you're basically talking to that audience like they're they're there to hear what you have to say, um, but but also they're open to your your thoughts on what what that means, right? What that means to 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 them. And the next thing you say is like you're addressing that. It's like I I I know that you're. I mean, this is an example. It's like I know that you're thinking that I said this and that means that. Well, this is what I really mean, right? So it's it's using a reference to like say a logical question that that listener might have from what I just said, and here's the answer, right? So um, it's being able to do that as a special skill. Mm. There's a there's a, a wonderful author named Tamsin Webster, who was just on the show recently, and she's written a book called Find Your Red Thread. And mm -hmm. when she's talking about it, it's message strategy. But uh, she says that you should be telling your story in the way that the people who are listening to you would be telling the story to themselves. Right. Right. right? Yeah. So <laughs> getting in their head, getting in their head and how they think about things. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah. so so that it's it, it is a skill. And I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on how someone should learn it? Is it just practice or is there somewhere someone can go besides reading Tamsin's book somewhere someone can go <laughs> to pick up that skill? Because it is a skill. Yeah, I think it's emotional intelligence, and it's and it also um, takes back to uh, takes the conversation back to uh, the the number two that I have there too, which is um, the the personality characteristics of the individual mm. uh, as well. Um, are they personable? Are they do they get excited by engaging and learning about other people and thinking about what other people are thinking, not just what they're thinking? Um, and and it's sometimes difficult to get out of your head like that, right? Uh, because we all sure. want to think about what we want to think. But I think it takes a certain curiosity, though, right? It, it takes a curiosity about the subject, certainly, but also about the people who are like I want to. You and I were just chatting about the fact that cats walk all over our keyboards, and I want to know what kind of cats you have. Those kinds of things are part of who I am because I'm such a, a cat nerd, but also that notion of being curious. Yes, be considerate, be appreciative, show care, like you said in your answer, but also be curious. And and then the question becomes, how do we cultivate that? Or is that, do you think, an innate skill? I think it just comes from, and this is what kind of separates um, podcasters and why some achieve more than others is, is that differentiation. And I think one opportunity is and your example is terrific uh, is about cats right um yeah you know, i mean you you can also thread in there um and ask your audience so well, tell me what cat you have or something like that you mm -hmm. know in the comments or something like that or g give me feedback about your experience with cats but you know being able to 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 use references to um to facilitate interaction with your audience uh and finding those opportunities those little hooks that that people will connect with um that that will get them to engage with you or send you an email um i mean it's it's been phenomenal to me over the years to um to talk about controversial topics um and then get uh, these these humongous emails from listeners um with um high some of them are highly critical uh other ones are very positive um and to be quite frank i I love to get all of them because I, f I, I figure if this person is writing me with negative criticism about my show every week, guess what? They're listening. <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. so obviously me being controversial and, and being challenging to their thoughts is what they want. Right. Um, so, so that's, that's sometimes, I mean, you kind of have to have a little bit of a thick skin as a podcaster, especially sure. if you want to tread into controversial topic areas. And I think, you know, Joe Rogan's another experience, uh, you know, another example of that, um, you know, and, and it's, it's just one of those things that you have to develop over, over time. I think to some degree, it's, I, I think some people have an innate ability to do it over others. And then I, I think others develop it over years of experience. Mm. 
Yeah, it, it's interesting to me to that that whole notion of shock jocks. You know, Howard Stern in the in the I guess eighties and nineties, and even the teen uh, in the aughts. Uh, Joe Rogan is another. It's it feels to me like they're deliberately controversial, and on some level, we as humans love the drama. We love the controversy. And so someone like me, I'm, I don't court drama particularly unless it's yeah. on stage or in a movie. Uh, yet, what what would you say to someone who wants to have meaningful discourse, who wants to talk about some topics that, are, that go in depth, but that might not be that controversial? Should you court controversy deliberately or is there another way? I think probably the best way to think about this is, is that I don't think that Joe just says to use in his show as another example is really purposely um, going after controversy. I, mm. I think what he's doing is he's purposely going after the truth. And, and I think that that's, that puts him in, you know, with a big target on his back because there are people out there, constituents that don't want information to be out. Um, so, you know, and that's one of the powers of podcasting. It's one of the, the, the mediums that really is a medium for free speech. And so, so it does give you the ability to, to, um, talk about topics that you just genuinely have an interest in and curiosity and you, you kind of, uh, leverage your own personal experience in many of these areas. And, and and I think Joe is a classic example. I think he honestly is curious. Is there something more that I can learn from experts, right? Um, that may be a little contrary to conventional thought, right? And and if that creates a controversy, I think um, um, that may be okay with him. Uh, I think it may be what has built his show over the years and he's learned that that is a technique the pursuit of truth and contrary opinions um is good for growing listeners and it's also mm. good because he just genuinely is interested in finding out the answers so um and i know for many years with the show that i did about the growth and development of the world wide web and the internet i was always pursuing guests that were going to give me perspectives on a certain technology um, development or a future looking perspective, whether or not it was controversial or not, it was more about the curiosity of finding out what could happen in the future mm. if this technology or this thing continues to develop. And in some ways, you know, um, some of the topics have been similar to that. Um, uh, for other shows that have been very popular too, it helps people kind of think about things in a different way. And, and, and sometimes that's what a podcaster, that's their job sometimes is to, is to be that educational, informational, uh, and entertaining. And sometimes being controversial or talking about topics that aren't normally talked about can be entertaining too. So. <laughs> yes, it can. Yeah. <laughs> for better, for, for good or for ill, for better, or for yeah. worse. Yeah. And, and, and yet, when when I'm when I'm listening to a podcast that has controversy in it, if I get outraged, one of the things that that what you said yourself, you know, be real, be authentic and, and also cultivate interaction. If I find it controversial, yes, I might what they call hate listen to it or whatever. Like you said, somebody comes <laughs> right. back and listens every week. But also there are generally ways to get in touch to reach out to the person, to comment, to tweet at them, to have that interaction that just a few couple decades ago we would never have had, right? There was no right. access, but now there is. And so yeah. that brings me to, to I want to talk about the third part of your answer, but mm -hmm. I also want to make sure that we put a pin in the notion of talking about that kind of access to interactions and future innovations. I want to be sure we talk about that because I think yeah. – there's a lot there, but let's go back to number three in the, the third part of your answer. You said creates consistent and good sound quality audio on a regular and predictable schedule. And so some of it, a lot of the stuff that I see in some of the Facebook groups and all of that, everyone's talking about have this mic and have this gear and have this soundproofing, blah, blah, blah. And then there are some people like Gary Vaynerchuk who don't give a hoot about their sound quality. They're just putting whatever it is out there. And he's pretty successful as far as as far as his podcast 
and all of his media reaching people. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, is it just that he's a superstar at this point and it doesn't really, he, you know, he doesn't care and that's okay and the rest of us should care? Or is there a distinction to be drawn between people who really go for that great audio versus people who just don't care and are just putting out content? Right, right. You know, just, just realize that when I wrote that number three, um, I would say that the most important thing is consistent um, and then good sound quality. I'm not saying excellent sound quality. Um, I think that the the value of the content is more important than the quality of the content. Mm, but that's mm-hmm. not to say that the quality of the content isn't important. It's mm-hmm. more of a it, it's more of a practical thing, right? Uh, when people listen to audio. Uh, at least historically, um, maybe it's a little less so now, but people oftentimes listen to podcasts in noisy environments, right? Mm. They'll listen on an airplane or they'll listen in the bus or on a, in a car or whatever, and there's a lot of other ambient noise around you. So good quality also means good volume level <clears throat> and the audio is clear and not full of noise, right? So... But that's not to say that noisy environments can't still be good quality. I think you referred to Gary and Gary, um, he does a lot of speeches and he, he does, um, he talks about topics with groups of people, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes the the situations that he's in are not studio situations, right? right? So they're doing the best that they can. He has a production team around him at all times. Um, w- when he travels and he goes places and they're constantly recording the interactions that he has with other people. And that gets back to what I was saying earlier, uh, being personable, be creating interactive opportunities with other people um, in different situations. And he creates conversations like on the street kind of stuff, right? Um, or kind of randomly in an office or walking down the street or all these different areas, which are more authentic, right? More real. It's Mm -hmm. not this contrived production. And Gary is very, and he's been this way for many years. He's, he's very edgy. Um, he's could be seen as very controversial too. Um, he, he challenges people, uh, to think about things in a different way, right? It, it may not be the conventional way that, you know, he and, um, Joe Rogan have a lot of commonality in how they think about the content that they're producing. They're genuinely curious and they're, I think Gary, what's different about Gary is that Gary genuinely wants to help people be mm. better at whatever they're doing. Mm-hmm. And that comes across in his, his conversations. It comes across in his emotion. It comes across in the messages that he's driving. And sometimes he can be, I, I've been in the audience at, at events where he's given speeches that, been, you know, it's one of those things, you know, um, I wouldn't get up on stage and say that, but Gary is in a different realm, right? He can, he can say things and be a little bit tough on people more than what most people would feel comfortable doing. Um, but he genuinely thinks, and he, I think he's correct most of the time that the advice that he's giving is good advice. Yeah, um, you know, yeah. <laughs> I I would agree. He and I are from a very we're we're neighbors. Where where he was born oh. in Belarus and where I was born in Moldova, we right. we come from a very similar background. And so a lot of what he talks about, for example, yeah. is very familiar to me. Right. Just familiarly familiar, if you will, and yeah. familiarly familiar. That's a good tongue twister. <laughs> <It> uh, <is. laughs> if you're listening to this and you have a favorite tongue twister, I would love to hear it because I'm always giving tongue twisters to my students and clients. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I guess the thing is for me, the consistency is important and having that predictable schedule, like you said, is important. And yet, what if you you can't for whatever reason then is you it can't okay <laughs> fair enough Ta-da. there's no there's no hard lines here i mean i think uh there are plenty of examples of podcasts that only publish once a month or they they publish um you know dan carlin does the hardcore history podcast and he publishes an episode like every three months or something mm. like that and he gets more downloads than most podcasts so um you know i think that 
you can utilizing the RSS podcasting specification once you've built an audience uh, and you produce quality content um, that people want to listen to. I mean, a lot of his shows are like three or four hours long, mm. but, um, but people, you know, he has a reputation for producing content that people want to hear. So, um, you know, whenever he publishes it, uh, people are jumping on it. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's great. <laughs> that's, that's a, that's part of the full spectrum of what's possible with podcasting. Not, mm -hmm. not, it depends on the kind of content you're producing. If you're, if you're producing content that's more timely, then consistency is very important. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you're producing kind of, you know, kind of like fictional stuff is timeless, right. Um, there, being consistent is just being able to tell the whole story, right? Chapter one through 12, you know, if that's your, your, your series, right? It doesn't have to be ongoing forever, but it, it just needs to be available in a way that your audience is anticipating it. Because what, what you're also dealing with when you build an audience is you're building expectations. You're, you're building um, your show into those listeners' lives. Mm. And if you're disappointing them by not being there when they anticipate you being there, guess what? They're going to listen to something else, which that's, that's the risk that you take. And that's one of the challenges of seasons uh, in podcasting is, mm -hmm. is a, there's many in the podcasting space that will tell you it's, it's, it's fine to have seasons, right? If you want to have season one, season two, season three, that has batches of episodes, but it's, it's best to have um, season one uh, end um, one week before season two begins, right. but, but it's, it's, but it's not that cut and dried either. I think it depends on what you need to do in your life too. So there is a factor of podcasting is about podcasters doing what they need to do in their lives, um, as well. And that they take the audience that, you know, supports them on whatever that approach is. Yeah, and that it, it is interesting to me that this notion, uh, I, my Aikido teacher, my Aikido sensei says, life gets in the way of art. And yeah. and, and it's really and it true. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, so you, you sort of have to, you, you have to deal with it. And, and the thing is, for a lot of us, podcasting started out as voluntary. Yep. You, there's no one standing over you saying you must have it done. But yep. if, if you're going to build an audience, if you're going to really make a successful podcast, it sounds like that, that consistency and that, that something predictability, I guess, yeah. is what you said is important. But yeah. having said that, some, some podcasters succeed, some, you know, they call it, I guess, pod fade, where, yeah. eh, and it peters out and it's gone. It's and about, it's, it's between somewhere when seven and 10 episodes is usually when it happens, if it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And then, and, and a lot of that is, are you passionate enough about your subject to keep yeah. prioritizing making it? But then right. there are some people who succeed and who really get a lot of recognition, who are who are elevated by their peers even and so i would love it mm -hmm. if we could pivot a little bit and talk yeah. a, a little bit about the hall of fame inductees and podcast movement like where what is that i know that you are one of the people who helped decide the chair you're the chairperson of the committee of mm -hmm. of the inductees to the hall of fame i would love if you could talk a little bit about what the criteria are and also if you don't mind talking about it who the people are and what it means to be in the hall of fame well, I think just generally, it's, I, I think it's a huge honor to be recognized by your peers as having a, you know, a significant con contribution to a, to a medium like podcasting. I, I think it's, I mean, it's a great honor for me to be inducted and get up on stage and, 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 and talk about that. Um, and thank people for, for supporting me over the years. And, and I think it's, as far as the criteria for for getting into the Hall of Fame, it is really um, let me kind of re reference it. Um, the criterion for entry into the Hall of Fame it is a combination of mainstream popularity, being considered a great podcaster or contributor to the industry by by your peers, and or excelling in the medium of podcasting as well as having a historical significance in a positive manner. So candidates should have something to offer in all three of the categories mentioned above um, and or be so outstanding in one or two that they deserve inclusion. To be eligible for entry into the Hall of Fame, 
a nominee must have completed five years since their first involvement in the medium, but longevity should not be considered a qualification in of itself. So that is word for word uh, what the eligibility criteria is. It's <laughs> on the, the the Podcast Hall of Fame website. Uh, if you go to podcasthof.com, you can see all of the uh, two, 2022 inductees and all of the current inductees going back to 2015. So uh, the the event did take a four year hiatus uh, from 2018 to now 2022, um, but it did go back much much more. I think we're up to 33 inductees in, um, when you include this uh, most recent eight um, folks into the Hall of Fame. Oh, that's fabulous. I love it. And I'm going to, if you're listening, I am going to put the link in the show notes so that you can access it very easily. Uh, so, so if someone does, do you put yourself up or does someone else have to nominate you like Wikipedia where somebody else has to create your page? <sighs> well, the, there is a nomination and selection committee um, of all of the, the past inductees. Um, so they they basically comprise the committee to select who's going to be added to the Hall of Fame. Mm. Um, so that that is the the pathway for for that. It's it's really there is no way that you can submit to it. I think it's it's the whole criteria of it is built on peer recognition. Mm. Um, and but all of the the past inductees vote on so let, so we created a, a massive list of people that um, qualified based on the criteria, mm -hmm. um, and then the the group of past inductees went through and voted on who who they wanted their their eight to be for uh, twenty twenty two, and that's what the list came out to be. It's a, it sounds like a very democratic process. I love it. Well, I mean that's the aspiration of it, you know. I was also, you know, the founding chairperson of the podcast academy that created the Ambies um, of awards too. Uh, I'm no longer the chairperson there, but um, but I'm still on the board. And that was the the process that we created there. We tried to create a really democratic process. You know, nominations came in um, from the, the the industry at large, so anyone can submit to mm -hmm. be uh, considered for an Ambies award, which is also being presented at podcast movement here on the 22nd of March. And, uh, and then the, the blue ribbon panel, and that's basically members of the Academy, um, that, um, select who the, who the nominees are. And then, and then, um, they select the, the winner. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, yep. it's, it, it is, an, it's always interesting to me to see, especially peer nominated, peer reviewed, uh, awards like this and mm -hmm. and inductions like this because it means that the people who are doing what you're doing recognize that you know what you're doing which i think is great because sometimes it it isn't that way and then you there, you, you kind of have head scratchers wait how what happened here how did that happen yeah. but this seems like it's very it's very much people who are already involved in the industry oh yeah who are the ones who are making these selections with it which i think is really it's amazing especially since there are so many different ways to podcast right, right. We, you and i were talking about that before we started recording this chat there are so many different possible ways to podcast different people are podcasting you know, I, I like, for example, I'm doing a every Tuesday right now I'm doing we're going uh, three other people and I are going through Julia Cameron's book, The Artist's Way, to talk about creative recovery and creative discovery. And we're literally reading the book, going through the exercises and then talking about our experiences. And those episodes are really popular because other people have been wanting to do it, too, and didn't even realize it. Right. And that's a that's a weird way to podcast for me. But I, I had the idea and went, oh, you know what, let's try it. And and it seems like anything goes, provided your audience is interested in it. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what you notice about the latest trends in the way people are podcasting and what innovations there might be out there for us to, to pursue as podcasters, for people who are interested in becoming 
you know, in the in the industry, if you will. Yeah, there's there's always a bit evolutions in the medium that are happening at all times um, that are taking us in different directions, either from a technology perspective or from a from a, a way of doing doing a podcast. And I think, um, but I have to say, you know, before I get into that in depth is, is that the very fundamentals of podcasting really haven't changed that much uh, in the, I mean, I've been involved in the medium since 2004. That's when I started podcasting. Um, and, you know, the fundamentals of it are really not that much different. Um, I think that the technology that we utilize to publish and to create the content that is then published, um, I think that has changed. Um, and, and how people are, are evolving, how they're producing to be able to accommodate the opportunities that are out there that have been enabled by Im improvement in technology. So um, I think some good example, and some of these are, you would be surprised, but some of these are, are things that have been around for a very long time and that it, 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 it's only perceived that it's something new. <laughs> um, mm. And it, and part of the reason why that happens is because there's a, always a constant um, inflow of new people into podcasting, right? So mm. there's been an expansion of the demographics of podcasting as well. So the, the understanding of the, of the 17 plus year roots of this medium um, doesn't go back um, very far because there's most of the people that have gotten involved in podcasting have gotten involved in the last um, seven to 10 years max. Right. Uh, pr people that were involved in the medium prior to that, uh, which is a very small number of people, um, witnessed some of these things being tried a long time ago or were big a long time ago that faded and then are coming back again. So, so you, it's easy. And I kind of fall into this trap sometimes too, because I, I, I do a show called the, the new media show. And we talk about the evolutions of podcasting and what's happening in the industry. And we're constantly having this debate with my co-host about things that, that happen today, and then always applying a historical reference to it. Um, to be able to say, well, that's been tried before. Is it, is it really going to work this time? Mm. <laughs> so, uh, and, and one of them is video. And I mm. think um, there's this tension right now, and I think it comes from um, live video that's really exploded over the last few years, the popularity of YouTube, um, TikTok, um, and Instagram, stories, and these kind of things have really kind of brought to the fore um, uh, video, right? Um, but people think it's something innovative in podcasting today. But when you go back to the past, and this is an example of what I was just saying, um, the early days of podcasting video was like 35% of podcasting. Hmm. So, but most people don't realize that. Yeah, so, I, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, because it, it was, video was available in the early days, and it still is in Apple Podcasts. You can still publish a, a video podcast RSS feed that enables Apple to download a, a video file, not just an audio file. So, and it will play it in a video player in your, uh, in your iPhone, in the Apple podcast app. So there is still podcasts are being put out as video. Um, but what we've seen, I, I think over the last, specifically over the last five years, mm. uh, has been an explosion in interest in um, making podcasts through like uh, platforms like Zoom or StreamYard or, mm. or, um, or Riverside FM, uh, where you're combining the audio production with the video production. And then you're able to either stream that live or you've been able to record it, upload it to YouTube into your YouTube channel and put it out that way. And that's been happening more and more. And then you're seeing content creators that are primarily YouTube video creators start to take the audio from their production on YouTube and put it out as an audio podcast. So you're seeing this kind of this convergence happening on, on that side as well. So I would say that one of the key trends right now is around the integration between video and podcasting, but in some ways that's a throwback to the early days of podcasting. Um, yeah. It's interesting. I feel like so much of this is cyclical 
It is. You know, I I was a DJ long ago, many, many moons ago. I was a radio DJ and uh, so much of of the way we did things. I mean, a lot of it was prescribed, right? You had to have you, you, you got two options an hour and the rest of the time you played the playlist and you had to read your PSAs, whatever, whatever. But the notion of being on on radio and, and reaching out to people in that way, that's what podcasting felt to me like when I first started hearing about podcasts in 2005, 2006. But I thought they were Mm -hmm. rarefied air, you know? But it goes back even further to the old radio shows of the 30s and 40s. So so we can look at all of this as a a cycle. And from radio, we went to television. And then from television, we went to, I guess, streaming, whatever, whatever. And it feels like this convergence that you're talking about of video and audio could be leading to something else. Is it leading to AR or VR eventually? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it's a good question about what's gonna happen with augmented and virtual reality when it comes to the podcasting media. I've been doing some thinking about that over the last probably six months to a year, um, especially as we've seen more announcements from you know like Facebook and and um, others out there too, even, even Microsoft. I mean, I used to work at Microsoft on the Xbox team and I would say that uh, Xbox is probably one of the pioneers in, um, in the Sony PlayStation as well, pioneers in the metaverse because um, mm-hmm. they created these interactive game experiences, right? That I was on that team at Xbox um, at Microsoft for, for like four or five years. So mm. I, I had a front row seat to this stuff a long time ago. Um, and back in those days, we were selling digital merchandise, right? Not unlike what we're seeing today with the NFTs and, and, um, people selling, uh, um, virtual goods right. in these, in these platforms. Um, I was a very early participant in a platform called second life, um, uh, which is a, a platform that was built by a company called, uh, Linden labs up in Seattle and, this was like back in the, uh, probably 2007, eight mm-hmm. timeframe uh, is when that platform started to really take off. And it, it was a virtual world. Uh, you could create buildings and you could have parties on an island if you wanted. You could have an event in there. You could stream stuff. You could talk to people with an avatar, all that kind of stuff. So um, podcasting has had a connection in those two virtual worlds for many years. It's just that we went through a phase where social media really caught everybody's attention. Mm. And when, when Facebook launched and Twitter launched and all those, and this was back in the 2007, eight timeframe, um, the attention from podcasting kind of went away. Um, it was all about you know, these social platforms where it was social media was the, was the buzzword and podcasting took a back seat. And to kind of paint it around and to the whole picture is that um, what's happened now, if you really think about it historically, is that the, the trust that we have in social media has been eroded right over the last few years, especially mm. probably since about 2015 or so. Um, it's been slowly eroding, right? And And it's for a lot of reasons of access to, you know, our data and the, the kind of corruption around that to some degree of, of people um, trying to monetize our personal data. And so, so you've had an erosion of trust in the social platforms. Mm. And so now you're seeing podcasting start to come into its own, right. Um, As a kind of a flip side to that people trust podcasting more than they trust social media. So, um, it's, it, it, it's one of those areas that has kind of evolved. And if you think about, um, podcasting the involvement in the metaverse and things like that, um, I think the Xbox will probably be the real pioneer in this, not Facebook. Um, so, so I'm not sure what it means for podcasting quite, quite yet. Um, mm. though podcasts have been done live, um, in, Second Life, um, going way, way back for for a long time. Um, So that may happen again. I think we may have shows that are done live um, in these platforms, um, in maybe Xbox or in maybe whatever Facebook comes up with, with the meta um, 
stuff in the metaverse that they're working on. We may see live podcasts show up in there. That's part of their kind of live streaming experience. Um, and as we create avatars and become more virtual, um, I'm not sure that that's going to be a revolution in podcasting really anytime soon. Um, I, I just, it's, it's going to be a few more years before, um, the augmented reality stuff and the, well, probably augmented reality is going to come first. The virtual worlds are going to be a little slower because I'm not, I think people are going to be nervous about getting too involved in in those worlds um, for many years to come. And the tech just isn't there yet, too. I mean, right, we're right. we're just we're just not there. It's it's wonderful to 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 theorize and speculate and and wonder and imagine, but right now we're just not there. And and yet there's there's it feels to me like in even the little podcasts that I have, there's a wealth to plumb. Right, there are all of these ideas that we can explore together. And and I get to have people like you on the show and ask you all the questions I'm curious about asking you. Yeah. And it's 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 amazing to me that 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 is possible. And in some ways, social media provides that. Right. The thing to me that's so fascinating about social media now is is access. Right. Mm -hmm. I, you I don't know if I'd ever been able to find out who you were if we hadn't been introduced by our mutual friend. Katie Chinakis. So, so how, how we access each other has changed also. And I think the podcasting space allows us to, I think it does allow us to give that little bit of extra, I hate saying the word authenticity, but that's really a, of no, being I, who you are, you know? That's exactly what it is. And I'm not sure that social media really does a good job of that. I, I think so, so social media tends to facilitate people um, putting out things that maybe can make other people feel bad um, or f feel in a bad way, um, just in a general sense. Um, so, and I don't think podcasting does that. Um, I think po podcasting is helpful to people's lives generally. Yeah, absolutely. And and the, the thing about, to me, about social media, even though we're not here to talk about social media, is that it's you know, it, it always feels like you're putting out your B-roll out there and everybody else has their greatest hits. So, so right. it's, it's misleading in the, in a way sometimes. And yet again, it, it, it provides what, what a friend of mine calls the social lubricant, right? It'll, it right. provides a, a connection points. And so mm -hmm. I, without that, I, I wouldn't have been able to say, Hey, Rob, come back on the show. And, and right. you would, you know, that that's a, that's inviting you back on the show is great. And I'm super grateful that you that you were willing and able to do it. And it's partially because we are, even though we can be thousands of miles apart, we have the ability to interact. And that's one of the yep. things both podcasts and social media allow. And I'm I'm very curious to see how AR and VR moving forward are going to uh, encourage that kind of interaction too. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's it's going to. Um you know, slowly, I think, become more a part of our lives. I, I think the first thing we're, we're going to see is more augmented reality, mm. where we're, um, we're going to wear devices or whatever that are going to present digital information layered on the real world. Um, I'm not sure that there's a strong pathway for podcasting with that. Um, but, but as you get into virtual worlds, then you can create you can go anywhere, you can be anywhere kind of concept, mm -hmm. right? The augmented reality is based on place, right? It's context to place. And that's not necessarily going to help you as a podcaster reach an audience in a, in a deeper way. Um, that's going to be the experience of the individual in layering on digital information onto their life. That doesn't mean that they can't watch a podcast through these devices or or listen to a podcast through these devices, they can. I'm just not sure that it's going to add any kind of layer of, of uh, presence, right? I think it may offer a pathway to, to, to interact with a podcast at a greater level mm. um, just because of the ease of access and the ease of these devices being built into our, our eyeballs or um, contact lenses or and glasses that they're going to have microphones and they're going to have um, cameras and things like that built into them that would enable you to interact with those shows in a way that maybe we haven't had before because people have been kind of detached from their devices up to this point. Mm -hmm. um, it's not been integrated into our lives. I mean, our, 
our our mobile phones with ear pods or whatever, there's probably more of a connection there than there ever has been. I think as you think about it, the ear pods could present an opportunity for interaction as well. Um, but I'm not sure that that's how ear pods are used with podcasting. Generally, I think it's more of a one way listening experience currently. Yeah, it feels it feels to me like it would be a. a a resource management nightmare too, right? right? If you if you were having a podcast and you said, everybody call in if you're listening or well, whatever, you know, how well, do you, you do know, that? I mean, really, there are examples over the last year about that. Look at uh, Clubhouse, uh, look at Twitter Spaces. Um, those are what I would consider to be kind of like talk radio slash podcasting slash live kind of interactive audio experiences, right? Mm -hmm. So you could... I mean, there were many months that I went by Clubhouse. I was walking through the grocery store listening to Clubhouse audio channels with, you know, 2,000 people in the in the room, right? All all talking about a, all sorts of different kinds of derivatives of a topic. Mm -hmm. and, and so we have had kind of like that randomized kind of joint kind of uh, experience around audio, but those don't necessarily make terrific podcasts though. Right. That's the, that's the thing. I mean, I tried to do the show that I, I do the new media show live on clubhouse for a while and then live on Facebook and all these live platforms. And it really never worked very well because the interaction is not what the format of the show is, right? So it became very distractive to right. the the podcast production to have new people up on stage, you know, for for an hour constantly asking different questions. You can't really stay focused on a topic. Sure, and I, and I saw some clubhouse rooms and Twitter Spaces rooms last six, seven, twelve hours. I can't I right. personally. <laughs> That's I, the other end know. of the spectrum, right? Yeah. Right. I have a cat to feed. I can't. I can't yeah. go. <laughs> So, so yeah. I need to eat too. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, there is the mute button, but still, it feels right. it feels very like I, I, I personally can't, yeah. and and that that does make me wonder if I'm. There's a little bit of a not a fear of missing out, but it does make me wonder if I'm missing out on a technology that I otherwise might be able to participate in, because right. it might not be for me. And then and then some of that I think is self awareness. What do you think about that? Is there is there a know yourself? part of podcasting as far as this kind of adopting new technologies thing is concerned? Yeah, I think um, certain individuals have propensity to have the tolerance for the, what are you going to say, the inconsistency um, mm -hmm. in, involved in trying to adopt new technology um, and the <laughs> failure that can oftentimes be associated with that experience. Um, I, I think that's a hallmark of my podcasting career is that I've, I've been kind of a technologist and I've been trying to push the envelope on things. And oftentimes, like I can give an example, just the other day, I was trying to create a, um, a audio clone of myself on a platform called Descript. Mm. Uh, and that is a platform that enables you to go in and voice train a, an AI agent to replicate your voice. Um, so you can actually, you know, write up a script or an outline and you upload it to this, um, this kind of, um, uh, clone of your voice and it will actually voice the text in your voice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a computer that does that. Right. right. So that's, that's fraught with issues too. And I, sure. I, I struggled with that too. And, you know, I had to do like 30 minutes of audio training to train this this platform to, um, to replicate my voice. And, and you just kind of think to yourself, okay, that can be a powerful thing, but it can also be a pretty scary thing. It means that For anybody sure. out there can replicate what I say online yeah. uh, to whatever they want it to be, right? It, right. If they have access to, to my cloned voice. And, and I think that there, there's examples of that happening on the video side too. I know Adobe has tools now that you can, you can take a video or an image and you can animate it and you can apply um, different voiceover to that. And, and you can train this, like a platform like this Descript to take, take a voice, you can train it by just uploading some audio to it and then you can type your own script out. And guess what? Wow. <laughs> you've, you've now replicated somebody else uh, in creating content that you would have produced yourself personally. And it's, um, it's a little scary on that side, but that, yeah. that, 
that also is an innovation that is happening in podcasting right now um, that may change the very fabric of it. And you're starting to see it a little bit more on even on YouTube where entire channels are being generated by artificial intelligence now, where they'll, they'll take a topic and you, you write an outline or a script for it, you upload it into it and the AI will, will go in and find all the images and videos wow. and, and um, actually voice it um, with a, a voice character that you selected or you created um, and auto generate these videos based on topics. So it, you wow. know, it could be a different way of producing content. It can be a powerful way of producing content because it scales very rapidly right? Um, and it can happen very fast. And that may be the new world that we're going into is, is a world that uh, it, there's still going to be a challenge with trust. And I think that's, that's where these technologies kind of run afoul of um, what we do here with podcasting is that it could get to a point where um, none of us can really trust the content that's online. Is it, is it really true? Is it authentic? Is it real? I mean, I think one of the biggest threats to podcasting today is what is the truth? <laughs> yeah, you know, absolutely. What, absolutely. What can you believe is authentic? Right. And, and, you know, what you, what you were just describing sounded a little dystopian for my liking, yeah. to, to be honest, because it is this, uh, what, where are we going and how are you going to be able to rely on things, especially since the push seems to be create content, create content, create content. So there are going to be lots of people probably who are going to go, oh, this is a really good way to save me a bunch of time. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you're creating quality Right. right. You're not cre necessarily creating authentic content that, right. that would be what you would actually say, the research you've actually right. done. Oh, that scares me a little, Rob. Thanks very much for that. My well, adrenaline yeah. spiked. Yay. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it is a, 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 a spectrum. It's like technology has always had this two headed um, beast to it. Right. Right. It, it can either be a, a good beast or a bad beast. Right. And te technology can be used in a positive way that can produce um, good stuff, or it can be used in a way that's deceptive and manipulative and, and uh, false. Yeah. And so, detrimental you know, for sure. Right. Right. And, and, and at the end of the day, sometimes you can't tell. Yeah. So it, it, I think that's, that's the question of the day. And I, I think it's a bigger question for artificial intelligence just in general mm. uh, is, is how as humans, are we going to manage this technology um, innovation that's, we're really on the on the, on the cusp of right now, um, yeah. and it's been building for a few years now, and it's only going to accelerate. Um, so, what the future looks like is a little bit um, hard to predict right now. Yeah, it's it's murky, and I think I spend a lot of time thinking about it too, from a creative perspective, from creativity's uh, sort of point of view, if you will. And it is th the same kind of thing happens. And we, we I, I'm in, in artist groups where people fight, you know, is if it's digital, is it really art, that sort of thing. And there's a lot for us to unpack. And, and I'm much to think about. And I want to thank you once again for, for taking the time to be on the show and to talk about some of this, because these conversations, I think, are important for all of us to be having as we move forward. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And I, I'm going to keep raising these topics too in the podcasting industry to, to draw a spotlight to them to some degree. I mean, it can also, also drive more people to go over and try and do these things too. So maybe that's not a good thing. I don't know. So, well, yeah. you know, be, be, have a healthy dose of skepticism with everything, right? right? So <laughs> it's a, right. it's a new condiment, salt, pepper, and skepticism, uh, I, I, or maybe critical thinking is a better way of looking at it. So again, Rob, I'm, I'm so, I'm really grateful you took the time and I, I know that you've got a day to get back to. So I'm going to ask you the one last question, if you don't mind, okay. that I ask sure. everybody who comes on the show, you probably don't remember it. But it's a silly question, and yet it, I find that it yields some profound answers. And the question is this. If you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Hmm. Um, be a good person to others. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. That's succinct and probably relatively easy to skywrite. So there you go. Right. Right. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Rob, thank you so much for being here. I, I really appreciate it. And every all of your socials and all of that, I'm going to put on the show notes. Is there okay. anything else that you would uh, would want someone who's listening to this to know? Um, I can't think of anything else other than just sharing the 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 website addresses of the two two events that are coming up uh, this week at Podcast Movement. If you want to go check out the Ambies, I'd go to just ambies.com. Uh, if you want to see who who the award winners are or who the nominees are prior to the the, the, the event. And then if you want to go see all the inductees into the Podcast Hall of Fame, just go to podcasthof.com. And if you want to read more about me and, and what I'm doing, I have a website at robgreenlee.com. Perfect. Thank you for detailing those. I, I, I'm glad you did that. I like asking about that because people learn differently. So some need to read it. Some are, are better at hearing it. And that's where we are. Once again, yep. I, I thank you, Rob. This has been Isolde Trachtenberg and Rob Greenlee on the Innovative Mindset Podcast, talking about podcasting today and tomorrow. Rob, thank you again for being here. Until next time, this is Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new, and it would mean the world to me if you told a friend about it. Today's episode was produced by Isolde Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results, although we can always hope. Until next time, remember to be bold, be creative, and most of all, be kind.